thank you all so much for joining us for this, the third in our three lecture series connected to our production of Feeding Beatrice, a Gothic Tale by Christian Greenwich. I'm Jen Gray, I'm Artistic Director of Forward Theater, and I have the privilege of introducing this evening's speaker. I'm going to use my little cheat sheet bio here. Um, so Dr. Khalid Wai-Long, PhD, is an assistant professor in the Department of Theater and Film Studies and the Institute for African American Studies at the University of Georgia. He has a lengthy and impressive career as a dramaturg. You can see more details in tonight's performance program. Um, he is also the co-editor of Contemporary Black Theater, Acts of Rebellion, Activism, and Solidarity, which is being published next spring. Um, this is the second show that we've had uh, Dr. Long dramaturg for us here at Forward. Uh, last season's Mom Had to Meet the Beatles by Adrian and Adam Kennedy, and then this production of Feeding Beatrice a Gothic Tale. Um, he's going to be talking about the legacy of Lorraine Hansbury. I am so excited to hear what he has to say, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Khalid Long. Hi everyone. Can you all hear me? Okay, so I'm pretty loud, so, and also that there's a microphone because I know we have some folks. This is being recorded. Um, so yes, I'm Khalid Long. I'm so excited to be here. Lorraine Hansbury is my favorite playwright. Um, and we were just talking in the back. A Raisin in the Sun, I think, is, is the most, is perhaps the most important, the only flawless play out there. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. My background, just to give a little bit more of my background, I specialize in black women playwrights. And so when I got the invitation to not only serve as a dramaturg for Kirsten Bridges' play, which I hope you all are seeing or have seen, um, but to talk about Raisin Hansberry. So I wanna thank Jane. Thank you so much for this invitation. Also, I wanna thank Celia. And I also want to thank Julie for just their gracious hospitality um, and all that they do to take care of the people here at the theater. And I also want to thank Amy Barberry for her gracious hospitality as well. So I'm going to jump in because I know that I am on. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I might just be on the stage. Um, I'm going to jump right in and then maybe, depending on the time, we can take a few questions just to open up for just a brief discussion. Sounds good? Before I start, how many of you here have seen and or know the play A Raisin in the Sun? Seen it, read it, know it a little bit. So I don't need to sort of, do I need to provide the synopsis for the show? Is it my talk? I might skip that page. Do it. Do a quick one for anyone at home. Do a quick one at home? That's right. Okay, Jim. Let's get started. <laughs> On January 19th, 1959, Lorraine Hansberry was in the Taft Hotel when she decided to write a letter to her mother, Nanny Perry Hansberry. She writes, Dear Mother, well, here we are. I'm sitting alone in a nice hotel in New Haven, Connecticut. Downstairs next door in the Schubert Theater, technicians are putting the finishing touches on a living room that is supposed to be a Chicago living room. Mama, it is a play that tells the truth about people, Negroes and life, and I think it will help a lot of people to understand how we are just as complicated as they are and just as mixed up. But above all, that we have among our miserable and downtrodden ranks, people who are the very essence of human dignity. That is what, after all the laughter and tears, the play is supposed to say. I hope it will make you proud. See you soon. Love to all. Two days after Lorraine wrote her mother, to which she replied by telegram, Dear baby, our thoughts are with you, the actors, co-producers, and director. A Raisin in the Sun opened for previews. The play would move on to previews in Chicago and Philadelphia before opening on Broadway at the Ethel Barrymore Theater on March 11th, 1959. A Raisin in the Sun was a hit among critics and audiences. The New York Times called it the play that changed American theater forever. Allow me to provide a brief synopsis for those unfamiliar with the play. A Raisin in the Sun tells the story of the Youngers, a family who lives together in a small Southside Chicago apartment. The patriarch of the family, Walter Younger Sr., has died, and his widow and children await a $10,000 insurance payout. They dream of the ways that the money can improve their lives. But Nitha, Walter's daughter, wants to go to medical school. Walter Lee Jr. hopes to use the money to purchase a liquor store with two of, two of his friends. Lena Younger, Walter Sr.'s widow, also known as Mama, puts a down payment on a house in a white neighborhood but allows Walter Jr. to manage the rest of the money as long as he saves a substantial amount for Benita's tuition. 
When the family faces backlash from the so-called welcoming committee of their new neighborhood, and Walter loses all of the remaining money, including Benita's tuition to a thieving investment partner, the youngers are challenged to remain proud and strong in the face of racism and misfortune. The play reflects a 1940 lawsuit in which young Hansberry's family fought against housing discrimination that prevented them from moving into a white neighborhood. As the story goes, on May 26, 1937, Hansberry's father, Carl Hansberry, moved the family to Woodlawn, an all-white neighborhood near the University of Chicago. Around the same time, Harry H. Pace, a prominent black attorney and president of the Supreme Liberty Life Insurance Company, purchased a building just east of the South Parkway on 60th Street. Consequently, Anna M. Lee, a white signatory of the Restrictive Covenant, filed suit against Hansberry and pays for $100,000, which the equivalent at that time was about a million dollars. When the circuit court ruled in favor of, of in favor of the of, in favor for leave for equity, the defendants, which included Hansberry and Pace, carried their fight to the Supreme Court of Illinois, which also upheld the legality of the restrictive covenant by a vote of six to one. They ordered the confiscation of Hansberry's property. The Supreme Court of the United States reversed the decision in 1940, but did not hold that restrictive covenants are void. Nonetheless, this case marked a significant beginning in the fight to desegregate neighborhoods, and this is what we see show up in Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun. But just because they won the case, this by no means deterred the family from racially motivated attacks. For example, in her memoir, To Be Young, Gifted, and Black, Lorraine Hansberry remembers living in a, quote, hellishly hostile white neighborhood and facing angry white mobs that spat at curse and pummel them as they walk to and from school. The famous Hansberry vs. Lee case occurred nearly 30 years before the Fair Housing Act, which forbade housing discrimination, was passed as part of the Civil Rights Act in 1968, almost 10 years after A Raven in the Sun made its Broadway debut. The original Broadway production won the New York Drama Critics Circle Award in 1959, defeating Tennessee Williams' Sweet Bird of Youth and Eugene O'Neill's Touch of the Poet, and it established Lorraine Hansberry as the first black woman playwright to have a play produced on Broadway. The play also established Lloyd Richards as the first director on The Great White Way. James Baldwin, a writer and close friend of Hansberry, said, quote, never before in the entire history of the American theater has so much of the truth of black people's lives been seen on the stage. A Raisin in the Sun, as scholar Soyika Diggs Colbert argues, begs the question as to how the, the home, the domestic scene of civil rights struggles, a scene that predominantly figures as women's space, participates in the global pursuit of black freedom that emerges when the younger family must reconsider its willingness to move, even after Walter loses the majority of the inheritance money. And let us be clear, the move does not solve the younger's problems or the larger social ills of black Chicago. Put more succinctly, desegregating a neighborhood was never the final goal for the younger family, but rather it was a radical practice to illustrate to white folk that they are not the controllers of neighborhoods or the world for that matter. As Michelle Gordon put it, Acutely aware of the social organization and violence at the center of Chicago's near absolute segregation, Hansberry stages a revolutionary intervention into the cyclical systems of ghettoization, proffering raisin as a dramatic prelude and challenge to the racialized rituals of ghettoization, desegregation, and organized white resistance. The move then for the younger family and for Hansberry's family and for June and Lori in Kirsten Greenwich's feeding Beatrice functions as a significant moment of disruption to white supremacy. It should be noted, however, that not everyone was in celebration of Hansberry's play. As Isaiah Wooden notes, the play, quote, led some to disregard her as an integrationist and worse, an accommodationist. This was a popular opinion held by many, including Amiri Baraka, formerly known as Leroy Jones, a spearhead of the black arts movement, 
the artistic sister of the black power movement of the late 1960s and early 1970s. However, much later, Baraka would later regard the, the younger family from a raisin in the sun as actually reflective of the essence of black people's striving and the will to defeat segregation, discrimination, and national oppression. In other words, Baraka came to recognize that Hansberry was more radical than he earlier recognized earlier. Her political and cultural ideologies were undoubtedly present in her artistic works. Take, for example, her final play, Les Blancs, produced posthumously on Broadway in 1970. The play broadly depicts the Mau Mau Revolution in Kenya from 1952 to 1965. More specifically, the, the play illustrates the African quest for freedom from European colonialists. Hansberry studied African history and read about uprisings in Kenya and other African nations before beginning Les Blancs to create a work that is obviously a well-informed examination of events in Africa. Thus, the play is a response to colonialism, capitalism, and anti-black violence experienced around the world. As Joy Abel has argued, we should view Le Blancs as a condemnation of colonialism in Africa and on another level as commentary on race relations in the early 1960s America. Unequivocally, Hansberry's oeuvre is a critique of the intersecting forces of racism and classism, among other isms, black folks experience in America and worldwide. Taken in total, Hansberry's body of plays bridge the nonviolent cultural politics of the 1950s and early 1960s civil rights movement to the more radical and revolutionary politics of the black power movements of the mid late 1960s to the 70s. So what are we to make of all of this? What is it about Hansberry's legacy that makes her relevant today? And how did Hansberry transform American theater, thus carving out a space for black women writers to follow in her footsteps? The obvious answer is that Hansberry used the public stage to illustrate that attention must be paid to race, class, gender, sexuality, and history. Thus, the black women playwrights who followed the path laid out by Hansberry, whom we can recognize as the heirs of Lorraine's legacy, have written plays that challenge and attempt to change an oppressive ideology, whether it be a white patriarchy, an institutionalized theater culture. Jen, I'm thinking about the ways in which we invite the audience to bring their full selves, or dominating male surety. Even more, they've used theater as a pulpit to assert, assault, and discover the complexities of survival for themselves and their communities. These include Ntozaki Shange, Glenda Dickerson, Anna Devere Smith, Lynn Nottage, Dominique Mariso, Katori Hall, and Kirsten Greenwich. Continuing the work initiated by Lorraine Hansberry, these playwrights have and continue to push theater into new territory. Most emphatically, they have taken up the role as a type of theatrical and dramatic historian, conjuring up spirits and stories to be documented through performance, as opposed to being omitted from the written text, that is, the history, books, and other materials that are now being banned or refuted across the country. Ntozaki Shange's choreo poem, for instance, for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough, was groundbreaking for theater. It was the second play by an African-American woman to appear on Broadway in 1976. It is in a decidedly black feminist performance, the text features seven women who are only identified by a color, for instance, lady in red, lady in blue, who detail their experiences of girlhood and womanhood. Shange's choreo poem garnered critical acclaim and had such a profound impact on African American theater, specifically because of both its subject matter, such as rape and post-traumatic stress disorder, and the structure of the play, which diverted from the realist model of theater and commingled African and African American derived cultural practices, including movement, dance, poetry, and song. Anna Devere Smith, who is known for her one-woman shows, revels in the genre of documentary theater. 
Some of her most celebrated works include Fires in the Mirror and one of my personal favorites, Twilight Los Angeles 1992, which takes up the riots after the Rodney King verdict. With Twilight, Smith seeks to highlight both the differences, the differences and commonalities of those involved in the 1992 Los Angeles riots. Thus, she is invested in challenging audiences to think deeply about our own identities and the identities of others, especially in terms of how these understandings may inform social unrest. While the 1992 Rodney King beating and its fallout are powerfully dramatized in Twilight, the devastating impulses behind these circumstances can certainly be linked to our current racial dilemmas. The tragic circumstances surrounding the lives and deaths of Trayvon Martin, Jordan Davis, Jordan Davis and Latasha Harlins remind us of the toxic ideologies and outrageous violence that still impress themselves upon our social conscience. Despite the passage of over 30 years, the racially motivated upheaval of the Ellen riots is an all too familiar territory, a painful reminder of the persistent and pervasive effects of racism. Nevertheless, we also know that progress has been made and it is toward these strides that Smith works, one step at a time through one character at a time. Smith observes that she is looking for the humanness inside the problems or the crises. Contemporary playwrights Dominique Mariso, Katori Hall, and Lynn Knowledge follows Hansberry the closest as one of the most produced playwrights today. Lynn Knowledge's works, for instance, also chronicles the African-American experience within specific decades. With a creative imagination, Lynn Nottage, tra tra Lynn Nottage travels across time, space, and cultures to examine untapped stories in the premises of history. Whether looking through the windows of a Congolese brothel affected by the Civil War in the Democratic Republic of the Congo with ruin, or stepping into a lower Manhattan Jewish tenement with intimate apparel, Nottage unabashedly finds herself crossing racial, ethnic, and ge geographic borders. Dominique Mariso explores issues of race and gender through her complex characters, family dynamics, and social issues surrounding the African American community. Traveling between fact and fiction, Mariso employs what literary scholar Trudy Harris calls an imaginative point of departure to reimagine African American history and subjectivity. Her Detroit Cycle, for instance, a three play series entitled The Detroit Projects, is a great example. For instance, her play Detroit 67 uses the 12th Street riots of 1967, also known as the Detroit Race Riots or the Detroit Great Rebellion, to examine interracial love, family history, and the eruption of violence as a result of police brutality and racial conflicts. Drawing upon historical events or periods as backdrops for her plays, Mariso's aim, however, is not to restage history, but rather to probe the significance of African-American history and culture across time and space. In other words, Mariso asks her audience to consider how the past influences the present. Broadway, for me, has never been the moniker of success. Likewise, the Tony Awards has never been what determines a play or a playwright to be a great success. Yet, when it comes to black women playwrights, it is vital to take into consideration the ways in which they penetrated the great white way. So I will close with this. In 1959, Lorraine Hansberry was the first black woman to have a play produced on Broadway. The 2011-2012 Broadway season featured for the first time three black women playwrights. Katori Hall's Mountaintop, Lydia Diamond's Stick Fly, and Susan Lori Parks' adaptation of Courtney and Bess. The most recent Tony Awards, which aired this past June, saw a host of black women nominated, including Alice Childress, the first black woman to, produce, to be produced on Off-Broadway. Lynn Nottage, Dominic Mariso, Christina Anderson, and Ntozaki Shange. And this list is only the playwrights, not the directors, not the black women performers, and not the black women designers, among other nominees. And so I'll close with this final question. 
Where would any of these women be if it were not for the rain hands, Mary? Thank you. So I think we're gonna, do we have more time for some? You do. Responses, questions. questions, thoughts, I don't know. I'm gonna step down, I kinda hate being up here. You got I'm gonna it. step down to join the community here. Uh, so yeah, any questions, thoughts, comments, we can open up for discussion, dialogue, maybe perhaps put this talk in conversation with Kirsten Greenwich's speaking Beatrice, which I know some of you are seeing tonight, so we won't give it away too much, but some of the themes and things that came out of that play. Hey, friend. Um, about 10 minutes ago, you referred to a playwright who did something about a family in Congo. Yes. Yeah. What is the playwright's name and what was the play? So that was Lynn Nottage, and I think that was talking about her play Ruined. Um, which she actually went to the Congo and she spent time with the women there. She actually does that a lot. So Lynn Nottage in many ways employs this kind of ethnographic practice where she goes and she sort of immerses herself and lives a month and gets to know the community members that she ends up writing about in her play. Um, and so that was uh, the play Ruin, um, which premiered in 2013 maybe. I, I may be skipping on the date, but that was that play. Um, also, uh, Lena, if I'm correct, did she win the Pulitzer for that play? I believe so. She won it for that play, and she also won it for her later play, Sweat, which was a play that dealt with class and subsequently racism um, within Reading, Pennsylvania as a fallout, you know, because of our economic fallout, which that's where we're always in. <laughs> um, you know, especially people my age, my God, I'll never buy a house. Um, <laughs> you know, so yes, and, and again, similar to Sweat, she also went to Reading and spent time with people. Um, and she recently just had a play premiere on Broadway, which was nominated for Tony Ward, which was Clyde. And the reason I'm naming that is because Clyde, the play that she developed, was, the material that was sort of left over from her interviews with Sweat is what she developed, how she developed the play Clyde from that material. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Yes. I've always been fascinated with Lauren Sanchez's poetry. Uh, I remember 59, that was the time when my family moved out to the inner city. So, yes. And that was a time when you didn't want to expose America's fan to everybody. Because you're going to get critics on the white side, you're going to get critics on the black side. Yes. You're going to get in trouble by talking about that kind of stuff. Yes. So that was bold. Yes. You know, can, thank you for that. Can I, can I respond to that? Sure. So, what is really interesting, uh, it, most, many of us here are familiar with the reading. It was a question I posed early on uh, to you all, and most of you say, yeah, I'm familiar with the play. There's a scene in that play that, that gets taken out a lot, and specifically on the Broadway production, but it is left if you buy the play, and it says in here, there's a note that says, you know you can perform this play or not. And it is the Mrs. Johnson scene. She's the neighbor of the younger family in that Southside Chicago tenement apartment. And she comes over for her good night coffee, um, and she is critiquing the family. She tells them, you know what's waiting for you on the other side, right? Um, and so what I think is really important, what's really poignant about that is that Ram Hansberry is saying exactly what you're saying, that not only do you get Carl Minner from the neighborhood, Woodlawn, who's a representative of the Neighborhood Improvement Association. By the way, I played Carl Linder when I was in college. <laughs> Make up in it. Well, that's another conversation. <laughs> white face, yeah. yes. It's another conversation. I went to an HBCU and we had no white students. Yeah. Um, at, that, at that time. At that time. Um, I did a good job. But anyway, so the Neighborhood Improvement Association, but then juxtapose that with Mrs. Johnson, who is a representative of the black community, who's also saying, y'all gonna, gonna be met with violence and resistance. But here's the thing a lot of people don't know. Lorraine Hansberry, so let me back up. You heard me say that Alice Childers was the first black woman playwright to be produced on Off-Broadway. She was supposed to have her play, Trouble in Mind, which just premiered on Broadway and was nominated for several Tonys, produced on Broadway before Lorraine Hansberry. She would not compromise the ending of the play, this play that is dealing with theater, actually I love plays that are about theater, and they're putting on an anti-lynching play. She would not change the ending to be a bit more powerful for the mainstream audiences, red, white, predominant audiences at that time, thank you. 
And so she didn't get her plate into the world with Rain Hansberry ended up going into that slot. Not the same year, but in terms of the first black woman on Broadway. What is really important then is to think about the fact that Rain Hansberry, so back to Lorraine, at the end of that play, she did change the ending of her play, Rain the Sun, to be with more power with the audiences. The original ending, the, fact, the younger family, you see them in the new home, but they have guns and they're at the window. Very much sort of invoking Malcolm X and this notion of why he is necessary, we will protect our families. And right there, that is the part where Amir Baraka says she's more radical than give her credit. Lorraine Hanbury, and this is what I say about people and their works, you can't just read one playwright or one novelist or one critic or one whatever and think that you know their body of work or you know sort of where they're coming from ideologically, culturally set. Got to look at their larger body of work, but you also have to look at the other writings outside of the creative work. Lorraine Hansberry is one of the most radical people, I think, and she modeled for us. She gave us this paradigm of how to sort of get to this idea of liberation and freedom for everybody, which significantly included getting away from material gains, and she was anti-capitalist. I read recently this work that I fell in love with, this new book about Lorraine Hansberry. And Lorraine Hansberry talks about the idea that even if your own family, blood family members, if they are not invested, deeply invested in freedom for everybody, so if you have a, a and she says, if you have a family member that's racist, homophobic, and all the other isms, let them go. And that's how radical she is, where she says, even with your own family members, you cannot accept the people who do not change to make the world a better place. And so, so I was sort of responding to that point. Like she was very bold and quite progressive, but significantly radical and very much a revolution. I think we may have time for one more. I just got the five minutes yeah. mark, and I think we're probably at the two minute mark. Hey, friend. I was just gonna say, no one else has a question. I, I have a somewhat personal question. So um, Linda Dickerson was actually a professor of mine when I was in college. Um, so since you mentioned- she, her, That's my book project. I wrote my dissertation on her. I would, I would love to hear we you talk. say something. Yeah. So we're not going to no one knows who she is. Yeah. We, exactly. We need to talk. Like, if you could tell, you know, share kind of her, her impact. Because Do honestly, even, even as a student of hers, <laughs> she didn't really talk a whole lot about what she did. She right. was, it was a history of the black theater course I took. Yes. Yeah, so she talked about everyone else. Okay, I'm going to do this in one minute, and then we'll wrap up. So for, we need to talk. Okay. <laughs> so my book project, um, it's called An Architect of Black Feminist Theater, Glenda Dickerson, Transnational Feminism in the Kitchen Prayer Series. That project she did at the University of Michigan, I see you in the shirt. Before she, she subsequently knew she died right after that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Glenda Dickerson was a significant pioneer in the 1960s black arts movement, particularly in D.C. When you hear people talk about black arts movement and when you hear them talk about the D.C., most of them will say Glenda was the black arts movement in D.C. She was the first principal of the Workshop of Careers in the Arts, which subsequently ended up turning into the Duke Ellison High School for the Arts, which is still around today. Um, she was the she was the, the one two she was the second Black woman to direct on Broadway with the 1981 production of Reggae, a musical revelation, which starred Shirley Crowley, which many of us probably know her from Dreamgirls, and also now that new show Abbott Elementary, um, and, and a bunch of other stars. Glenda Dickerson was a pioneer of black feminist theater and performance. She was a director, she was a writer. How she was doing this kind of stylistically devised work 10 years before Sean Gay developed the term choreo hall, right? But Linda never saw her work being entered into the mainstream commercial work outside of directing. She was the premier director of her time, right? Devised artist, um, and, and Linda, I, the last thing I'll say is, she wanted liberation. And Lorraine was her, Lorraine was sort of the inspiration. She talked about that being 16 years old, her father recognizing that she's getting interested in theater because she was doing a lot of oratory reports in college and poetry, excuse me, in high school poetry. Her father came to her at breakfast one morning and said, here's these two newspaper clippings. One of them was this new play on Broadway by Lorraine Hansberry, Awaiting the Sun. And the other one was marking the opening of this new theater, off off Broadway theater by this black woman named Ellen Stewart. Mm -hmm. La Mama. La mm -hmm. you know, Mama Theater Company. So that's today one of the first multicultural mm -hmm. theaters and experimental theaters. 
And it was then where Glenda said, I want to be like them. And that's where she got her start. Friends, I think we got to end yes, here. Yes, thank you.